All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky, sponsored by Squarespace. And quick announcement, the Constellation hoodies that have got Constellations printed in the hood, now available in the merch store. Link is down below, but it is April 2022. So we are saying goodbye to Orion and the Winter Constellations, but that does mean that we get more time with the Milky Way core. Coming up this month, we also have the Lurids Meteor Shower, as well as the Eton Aquarius Meteor Shower becoming active. There's a partial solar eclipse. It's galaxy season, for those of you deep sky astrophotographers, and Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation in the evening skies. And we also have three planets in the morning skies to look forward to as well. But before we deep dive into all of that and more, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the place to host your website or online store. And I should know because my website has been with Squarespace for years now. And it's one of the big reasons that allowed me to quit my job and become a full-time photographer. It's a place where I can host my images in galleries. It's also a place where I sell my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. And I also sell physical products like my calendars at the end of the year. If you'd like to give Squarespace a try, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Alan. It's incredibly easy and intuitive to use. It's drag and drop. You don't need to know any code. And then once you're happy with your website and you want it to go live, use the code Alan at the checkout for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name with Squarespace. Starting in the northern hemisphere facing north towards the circumpolar constellations and you notice Ursa Major pretty much overhead as night falls and there are a few nice galaxies within the border of the constellation. You have M81 Bode's Galaxy and M82 the Cigar Galaxy right next to one another. And then there's also M101 the very photogenic pinwheel galaxy. And zooming back out, you'll notice Cassiopeia now skimming along the northern horizon. And there's also a faint section of the Milky Way running from Auriga through Perseus and Cassiopeia before the Cygnus region. Facing west, and as the month goes by, you'll find it easier to spot Mercury in the evening skies. That reaches greatest eastern elongation at the end of the month on the 29th, when it will be 20.6 degrees away from the sun in the sky. Zooming out and taking a more general look at the western evening skies, we will get a last glimpse of the winter constellations like Canis Major, Orion and Taurus. They'll be very low on the horizon as darkness falls and won't hang around for much longer. Facing south and with Leo coming to culmination, it's a good time to photograph the Leo triplet, which I'll talk about shortly. And also with Virgo coming to culmination close to midnight, it's a good time to photograph Markarian's chain, which is a stretch of galaxies that forms part of the Virgo cluster. Zooming out and facing more southeast, the Milky Way core now rising into the night sky earlier, and it makes its way further into the south before the morning twilight. It's still a good time of year to capture a Milky Way arch panorama by facing east, and you'll have the core in the southeast. In the eastern morning skies you'll then find Venus, Saturn and Mars together low on the horizon and on the 5th you'll see Mars and Saturn in conjunction. They'll be closer than half a degree in the sky. Then towards the end of the month when Jupiter is a bit higher it joins Venus, Mars and Saturn and on the 26th, 27th and 28th a crescent moon will pass by all of the planets in the morning skies. On to the southern hemisphere and facing south towards the circumpolar constellations and as darkness falls the small and large Magellanic clouds can be seen dropping down to the horizon and the Crux and Carina are now high in the skies so definitely worth pulling out the star tracker and getting some nice detail out of the Carina nebula and the Colsac nebula. Facing west, you'll spot Mercury in the evening skies, and that reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 29th, where it'll be 20 degrees away from the sun. And then zooming out to a more general look at the western skies in the evening, you get a last glimpse of Orion and Taurus and Auriga and the southern summer constellations setting in the western evening skies. Swinging over to the east and the normal region of the Milky Way will already be above the horizon as darkness falls and the Milky Way core is well above the horizon by local midnight. 
This is also a good time to get a Milky Way core arch facing south. And then the core continues to climb higher into the east as the night goes on. As we approach the pre-dawn hours facing east, you'll spot Saturn, Mars and Venus. Saturn and Mars come into conjunction on the 5th, where they'll be less than half a degree away from each other in the night sky. And then you'll also catch Jupiter rising just before sunrise. Towards the end of the month, from the 25th to the 28th, those planets will also be joined by a thin crescent moon. The Star Tracker target this month is the Leo Triplet of Galaxies, otherwise known as the M66 group. It's made up of three galaxies, which are M66, M65, and then NGC 3628. They're found just a little southward of the star Churton in the constellation Leo, so somewhere on the rear legs of the lion. As usual, I'll add some links in the video description down below for more useful information about that target. Full moon this month is right in the middle of the month on the 16th, and it's the pink moon because of the phlox flowers that spring at this time of year in North America. Now on to the special events this month. So we do have a meteor shower to look forward to in the Lyrids, and it's active from about the 15th of April to about the 29th of April. The peak is expected around the 22nd, so that might be the night of the 21st into the 22nd, or the night of the 22nd into the 23rd. But on the peak, under perfect conditions with no moonlight, no light pollution, and the radiance of the meteor shower nice and high in the sky, you can expect about 10 to 15 meteors per hour. This year, there is a last quarter moon, so a 50% illuminated moon rising in the pre-dawn hours, which is going to wash out some of the fainter meteors, but it's not the end of the world. Now, the radiant point of the meteor shower, as the name suggests, is in the constellation Lyra. For us in the Northern Hemisphere, Lyra starts the night rising in the east. It climbs higher and higher into the southeast as we approach sunrise. But remember, you don't have to look in the direction of the radiant point to see meteors. They will fall all over the sky. It's just that the higher the radiant point gets in the sky, uh, the more meteors you will see, the higher the rates will become. And on the night of the 21st and into the 22nd, a quarter moon will be rising at about 3 a.m. local time. The next night on the 22nd into the 23rd, it will rise at about 3.45 a.m. So it's not taking away that many hours of darkness in the pre-dawn skies. Even though the pre-dawn hours are the best to view the lyrids because the radiant will be higher in the sky, it's not taking away too many hours of of darkness because if you're in the UK or mid latitudes then the moon rises around the same time that twilight kicks in anyway so it's not really hindering the meteor shower as much as twilight is. If you're closer to the equator then yes the moon's going to be taking away some hours it's going to be washing away some of the fainter meteors and for those of you in the southern hemisphere it's a bit more difficult to observe you'll have a better chance facing north in the pre-dawn hours but you're going to have to compete with that rising quarter moon but maybe worth your luck and seeing what you can find because we haven't had a good meteor shower for a while now and there's another meteor shower that becomes active this month the Eta Aquarius it becomes active around the middle of the month but it doesn't peak until May so I'll talk about that in more detail in next month's video there's also a partial solar eclipse to look forward to on the 30th this month but only if you're in the southern half of South America <laughs> that makes sense. The maximum magnitude is just over 0.6, I think it's about 0.64. So just over 50% of the sun is going to be covered by the moon if you're on the southern tip of, of Chile or Argentina. If you're in the sort of middle of South America, then the magnitude of the eclipse is only going to be about 0.25. So only about 10 to 15% of the sun is going to get covered by the moon. Please remember to always use safety glasses when you're looking at this event. Make sure you have proper solar glasses and make sure you have proper protection on the front of your telescopes or lenses as well. But as usual, I'll put more links in the video description down below to more location specific uh, information about observing this event. 
And that's all I've got for you this month, guys. Now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens. And then pick my favorite three for a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a photo view photography guidebook of their choice. And first place wins one of the brand new Constellation print hoodies. Last month's theme was the zodiacal light, and it's normally a subject that doesn't get many entries, but this year you guys really outdid yourselves. So in third place was this image from Sean in Ireland of the zodiacal light out to sea, just absolutely beautifully composed, and I love the cool, calming blue tones. In second place was Kenneth at the Trone of Pinnacles, a location I would love to visit, but he gets bonus points here for capturing the Gegenschein part of the zodiacal light, a real faint bulge at the anti-solar point, so kudos to capturing that. And in first place was Jay Luton, and he had a couple of images that I considered winners this year. I think this one was perhaps the most impressive, stunning panorama of the winter Milky Way, but also the band of the zodiacal light as well. You could kind of see the full arch there with that triangular diffused glow close to the horizon, really nice and bright. And also some real nice hydrogen alpha data in there as well. So absolutely stunning image. This month, let's go for something a little different and inspired by Jay Luton's image there. Let's go with panoramas. So absolutely any subject, any theme you like, just make sure it's a panorama. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.